All right. Okay, now, the, you know, I'm really glad this year that the Sabbath ended on the last day of the year. Uh, I wish it did that, was that way every year because it gives us a chance to kind of look back at 2016 and look forward to 2017. And it gave me a very simple uh, idea, and that is to give a 2017 charge to you all. Now, I don't know if you know what a charge is. If you've been to convocations or different meetings, oftentimes at the very end of that, they will give you a charge. And a charge is, in, in, in a charge is the idea of it is to inspire you, to stretch you, to challenge you, to motivate you. And that's what I'd like to do this morning. Last year, those of us who attended the GYC, uh, at the very end Sunday, they gave a charge to us. And that was a very inspiring charge. I go to these ministers' meetings a couple times per year. And at the very end of them, they're two, three days long. At the very end, the conference president will get up and he will give us a charge and it's designed to challenge us as far as the mission that we have. And so that's what we're going to talk about here this morning. I got three points I want to look at here. Number one is we're going to look at prophecy review. Where are we at in Bible prophecy? It's good to revisit this from time to time so that we know uh, exactly in God's great timeline of prophecy where we stand. Number two is we're going to look at afflicting the soul. You know, we believe that we're living in what's called the antitypical day of atonement. Back in the Old Testament, they had this day of atonement that pointed forward to the one that would take place up in heaven. And so since 1844, we believe from the Bible that we are living in the day of atonement. Well, back there in Leviticus, God told them to flick their souls. What does that mean for you and I as we begin 2017? And lastly, I'm going to look at some practical things that we can do in the new year. Okay, so let's pray together, then we'll begin. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for your great blessings to us. And Father, uh, it's just so wonderful to see a, a young boy being dedicated to you and hear special music and children's story and all that we've heard. But Lord, now we want to pray that you will speak to our hearts. And Lord, we pray that each and every one of us, we know, Lord, that we have challenges and difficulties. But Lord, we ask right now that your Holy Spirit will take this sermon and speak to all of us in here in different ways that we need to grow and draw closer to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name that everybody say it. Amen. All right, let's start it off. Where are we at in prophecy? A little bit of a review. Now, a very, in, in a very general way, God gave this prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 that kind of gives us a very, uh, a very general sense of where we're at in Bible prophecy. Now, in this Bible prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, you tell me, where are we at, everybody? Are we up here in the head of gold? Yes or no? No, where are we at? We're way down here in the toes of this prophecy that God gave in Daniel chapter 2. So that is a very broad view of where we're at in Bible prophecy. Europe has been divided into ten, and then we are waiting the next thing in this, and that is the second coming of Christ. Daniel chapter 7 also gives us a little bit more information. It tells us all these same countries would come. Then the last one we know it would divide into ten. That's in Daniel chapter 2 also. But then Daniel 7 tells us the Antichrist would come. Then after the Antichrist, you read there in Daniel chapter 7, there would be a judgment in heaven and then Christ would come. And so that's where we're at in between the Antichrist domination of 1,260 years after that and the, the second coming of Christ, the judgment. We are right in the middle somewhere in that uh, great overview of prophecy. All right? But I'd like to do right now in this first point is take a closer look, kind of a microscopic view at prophecy. Now, I took advanced biology when I was a uh, senior in high school and uh, we got to use a lot of microscopes and it was very neat to look at these bacteria and different things. I know Leon, this is a big part of her work, looking at microscopes. And one day, I did something that the, the teacher got very upset with me. I had kind of like a scab or something on my hand, and I peeled that off to get some blood. I took in some blood and put it on a slide. And, you know, that was when AIDS was so scary back in that day, you know. And so I did that, and I got in a lot of trouble. But it was really neat to look at my blood under the microscope, right? And so microscopes help us see things in a very focused, a very magnified view. And I'm so thankful for this book called The Great Controversy and other books like it that have give us kind of, they magnify these prophecies and they help us understand kind of inch by inch where we're at in Bible prophecy and that's what we're going to look at now. Okay, so three things under this, this closer look uh, we're going to look at spiritualism infiltrates all religions. Where are we at? We're talking about in Bible prophecy false revivals based on emotion and number three is Catholics and Protestants are uniting and then I'm going to share with you the catalyst the trigger that's going to trigger end time events and then we'll move on to point number two. Okay, so first of all let uh, let me share this with you. Uh, Testimonies Volume 5, page four, uh, 542 says this. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the issue, the true issue. That would be like the papacy. 
but many who unite in the movement do not themselves do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending so in other words there's a lot of good men who have good motives who just are not studying the word of God but they are kind of getting caught up in this movement that it's leading this way but they themselves do not understand where it is leading now let me give you an example of this here's a picture of this gentleman right here who I have a lot of respect for you may know who that is from the screen that's Dr. James Dobson, and Dr. James Dobson's uh, the founder of Focus on the Family, and uh, he is, you know, kind of retired now, and at, in his heyday, he was very heavily involved in politics, right? And he wanted to see religious principles getting into politics. Now, the gentleman on the other side of the screen is Lincoln Steed, and he is our editor for our Religious Liberty magazine. I really appreciate this guy's ministry. He kind of keeps us up to date on what's happening in religious liberty. Well, I heard Lincoln Steed share this story that why at one convention, he actually sat down at the table right next to uh, Dr. Dobson. And they introduced themselves, and he, Lincoln Steed told him who he was. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. And Dr. Dobson said, you know, listen, this was just very adamant. Look, you guys believe that I am going to uh, be a big part of triggering this national Sunday law. And he told him, he said, look, I have no motivation. I have no intentions to do that at all. And actually, Dr. Dobson wrote a letter to the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference telling us that he is not supportive of that. He's not going that direction at all. Well, I believe him. I believe he has honest motives. And I believe other people do have honest motives. But I think that's what's going to happen as we're going to see these points is everybody it's going to be so swept into this thing that they don't realize from cause to effect what is actually taking place, right? So uh, I realize that a lot of people don't know that what is going on and where these things are leading. So let's talk about these. First of all, here's where we're at in Bible prophecy. Spiritualism is infiltrating all religion. Now, what is spiritualism? Spiritualism is the idea that when you die, you're not actually dead. And that the idea that somehow you can communicate with your dead loved ones. That is the definition of spiritualism. Now, notice what uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 through 11 says. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and what's this next word, everybody? Lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception. Do you get the idea there that this is going to be a very easy thing to discern, yes or no? No, right? It is something that is going to be so tricky, so deceptive, so sneaky. In other words, your sen you cannot rely on your senses. You might see something that looks very real and is talking very real to you, but it might not necessarily be of God, like an angel, for example, right? Because Satan is going to not pull any any punches here at the end of time and those who are going to be deceived are those who do not love the truth of God's Word regardless of how nice of people they are that's what the scripture teaches right now the great controversy says this Satan has long prepare uh, long been preparing for the, his final effort to deceive the world little by little now here's now I'm gonna pause right here she's gonna tell us that little by little Satan is trying to do something in society all right what is he trying to do little by little, inch by inch. So in other words, it doesn't go from here to over here just like that. It goes very slowly and creeps very slowly. That's how Satan operates. That's how he moves. So little by little, Satan is going to be doing something. What is it? He has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the develop of, what's that next word, everybody? Spiritualism. So see what he's trying to do? He's trying to infiltrate society with the idea that when you're dead, you're not dead, and that you can connect with your dead loved ones. Now, is this happening in our society? Yes, absolutely, okay? Is spiritualism making an impact today? Notice some of these books here. Here's Pat Robertson, Life Beyond the Grave. Now, these are bestsellers. You see these on talk show, 90 Minutes in Heaven. They've made movies of them, Evidence of the Afterlife. And so all these ideas. Now, by the way, some of you heard me share this before. There was a young man uh, years ago, uh, I don't know how old he was, he, wrote, he uh, wrote a book that he had died and gone to heaven, and he talked to his grandpa and all this, and later on, when he was 18 or 20, something like that, he actually gave his heart to Christ, began reading the Bible for real for the first time, and he admitted that, that he was lying, that he was telling a lie, that he actually did not do that, but he was trying to get attention. So people who tell these stories, they get their names, they get mo books written about them, movies written about, uh, told about them, right? And uh, multi-million dollar bestsellers. But my friends, the Bible teaches that when you die, you're dead, resting in the grave until the second coming of Christ. That's what scripture teaches. Now let me give you uh, an example here of how deceptive 
deceptive these things can be. Now, there's this movie right here. Anybody ever seen the movie called The End of the Spear? I read the book. Okay, it's a very famous story within Christendom. There was this group of young missionaries that went over to this uh, particular uh, place where it was kind of primitive. And while they were there, they had their, their airplane, and some of the natives came and they killed them with the spear. Well, later on, the story goes, the guy who was kind of the leader of these people who killed these missionaries, he becomes converted to Christianity, and he travels all over the place telling the story. And when he tells this, when he tells the story, he tells them that he saw their spirits come out of their body and go to what he thought was heaven. So you read a story like this, and you think, wow, that's amazing. But it doesn't line up with what the Word of God says. And so what I'm trying to say here is that Satan, when he comes here at the end of time, our senses are going to deceive us, and we need to rely solely on a thus saith the Lord. Can you say amen to that, everybody? All right. So notice all these movies, The Walking Dead. This one right here, Lucifer, this new television series. I have not seen it. I just read a little bit about what it's, uh, it's about. You know what it's about? Satan kind of has a change of, uh, of, of attitude, and he becomes this kind of good guy who helps the police force. That's a big television show. The Young Pope is out there in all these movies about vampires and zombies. Okay, so Satan, little by little, is, uh, is, is convincing people that when you're dead, you're not actually dead. And notice what the great controversy says here communications from the spirits will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejectors of Sunday of their error. That is what's going to take place. He's working that way little by little, but people are going to see their dead loved ones, and they're going to say, oh, well, we need to do this or this, but it doesn't line up with the Word of God. But only those who have fortified their mind with the truths of God's Word will not be deceived. Now, notice this right here. They will lament these spirits claiming to be from heaven. Great wickedness in the world and the second testimony of religious teachers that the degraded state of morals is caused by the desecration of Sunday. Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept their testimony. So if you stand up against this thing and say, that's not your dead loved one, my friend. That's actually a demon disguised with your dead loved one. Great indignation will be excited against you at this time. Now remember, the world is falling apart and we're talking, we'll talk about that in just a moment, okay? All right, so number two, False revivals would take place based on what, everybody? Uh, based on emotion. Notice what 2 Timothy 3 says, that in the last days, but know this, that people will have a form of godliness, but denying its power. So with their mouth, they confess Christ, right? And they, they convince everybody that they're this great Christian, but if you look in their life, there's no power of the Holy Spirit because they're not obedient to God's word. And the Bible warns that that would take place. Now, what's happening in Christendom, I'll get back to the great controversy, it says this, in many of the revivals which have occurred during the last half century, there is an emotional excitement, a mingling of the truth, with the false that is well adapted to mislead and so what's happening in society is that a lot of these revivals are based on emotion and music and excitement and not on God's word now I'll tell you I was watching this you know, years ago several years ago I just saw this great big convention and uh, I, I was watching it just a little bit in the music and people were jumping around and and praising God and it was just so really almost you could if you didn't know if you couldn't speak English you'd think it was a rock concert there and I thought to myself my 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 would I hate to be the one who got up and gave a Bible message after all that can you think people can focus in on the Word of God when people are jumping around and shouting then you try to get them to focus in on a prophecy oh my word that's why ministers have to jump and leap and shout and all this stuff because people can't even focus people can't even sit through a sermon 30 minute sermon without falling asleep right and uh, so they need all this jazz and excitement. But, you know, they do go through all that, and then they read like one verse, and they close their Bible, tell a few jokes, and everybody goes home, right? And so it's based on emotion and music and not on transformation through the Word of God. That's what's taking place. Okay, third point under this one, then we're going to move on to point number two. And that is Protestants and Catholics uniting on common points of doctrine. The Bible says this, these are of one mind and they will give their power to the authority of the beast. There's a great movement in society uh, where religions are uniting and particularly Protestants and Catholics. Now notice what the great controversy, page 445 says. When the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrines as are held in them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions. And so she makes it very clear that Protestants and Catholics are going to unite, not on the Word of God, but what ties them together politically, and eventually they're going to enforce, uh, push for the enforcement of some of these things. Now, I think the, probably the best 
I'm not going to give you so many illustrations, and most of you have heard so many lectures on this, but I want to share with you something kind of recent. So NPR, on their website, shared this. And it's talking about, you know, that, as you know, uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis on the church door there at Wittenberg on October 31st. Anybody know what year it was? 1517. So that would make this next year how many years since Martin Luther did that? 500 years. So next year is the 500th anniversary of what Martin Luther did, nailing 95 Bible arguments against the papacy and particularly, now listen to this, don't miss this right here, particularly the sale of indulgences. That's what he was so upset for because the church was selling salvation, using these works to say that you could, uh, you could make it to heaven, all right? So notice what the Pope Francis is going to do here, NPR reported it. One of the greatest risks in Christianity between Catholics and Lutherans isn't what it used to be, all right? Wow. Okay, it says that. As a sign of those much improved relations, Pope Francis is traveling Monday to Sweden, an overwhelmingly Lutheran country, to kick off a year-long commemoration of the Protestant Reformation that split the church, churches 500 years ago. Last June, Pope Francis went so far as to praise Luther, once deemed a heretic by the Catholic Church, as a great reformer. Now, a lot of people are going to read that and say, that's good. Yeah, it's nice, Catholics and Luther's coming together. But let me just share with you. In the book, Great Controversy, she says the papacy is a chameleon. He knows how to adapt and change himself to best uh, uh, get his agenda accomplished, right? Because I want you to know, so what was Luther particularly upset about in 1517? What was the thing I said earlier? Indulgences. So let's jump back here. Notice this right here. Pope Francis had decided to grant plenary indulgence opportunity throughout the 100th anniversary of the, of the so-called apparitions of Our Lady of uh, Fatima, Fatima in Portugal. The indulgence year began in November 27, November 27, 2016. And so in other words, if you pray to the Lady of Fatima, if you go into where the apparition supposedly took place, you can get indulgences for that. And so has he changed, yes or no? The very thing that Luther upset. Now he's going throughout all Europe and saying Luther was a good man, but he's still teaching and practicing and promoting the very thing that caused Luther to get that hammer and that nail and nail that thing to the church door in Wittenberg. So you see that Catholics and Protestants are forgetting this stuff and they're uniting based on political agendas, all right? And we know that uh, this is, I think this is very interesting, the Lord's Day Alliance in the United States, they are pushing Sunday laws and they say this, Sunday is a mark of Christian unity. Now that's a very interesting word there, isn't it? It's a mark of Christian unity because we believe that Revelation talks about a mark also. All right. And all these men who Christians adore, they are all very heavily influenced by the Pope and really are chummy chummy with him, even with his doctrines. And it's surprising because had Martin, if you could raise Martin Luther from the dead, he would not be deceived by what's going on. But here, let me share with you the catalyst. So we have these three things that are happening. This is where we're at in Bible prophecy. We have uh, spiritualism becoming more and more prevalent. We have uh, a lot of false revivals taking place here, not based on the Word of God, but based more on emotion. And then you have Catholics and Protestants uniting. But what is the catalyst to all this? What is going to be the kind of the key thing that triggers this? Now, let me just share with you just real quick. You can see there there's some ingredients for probably a soup or something like that. I got it offline. And uh, you know that a good soup needs a base to it. And uh, I'm a vegetarian. And a couple of months ago, I was at uh, Walmart, and I grabbed, I saw there was, I, I, I like this lentil soup in these Progresso cans, it's called. Progresso is the name of it in these cans. And I saw this new one they had called Zesty Southwestern Vegetables. And it had a picture of it. So I grabbed it off the shelf, and I'm looking for two things on there that I do not eat. Noodles and meat. And it didn't have noodles, it didn't have meat on it, and said vegetables all over the place. So I take it home, pop it open, start eating it, and I'm telling Beatrice how good it is. I got two cans, just in case I didn't like it. I got two cans, and I'm eating it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to add this to my repertoire. This is such good food. And she goes over and looks at the can. She said, you know what the base of this is? It's got... I don't remember if it was beef broth or chicken broth to it. I was like, oh, because I thought, oh, I got this nice vegetarian thing. So the kind of the, the, the broth is the base of it. And what is going to be the key trigger to all these things? See, the Pope can't do this right now. The key religious leaders, they can't push their religious agendas right now. And so they need a catalyst. And what is that catalyst? And we're going to see it here in just a moment, all right? Okay, so in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God says this. The whole chapter is a beautiful chapter. God says, you're going to be blessed if you do this. You're going to be cursed if you don't 
don't do this. In other words, follow his word. All right. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 says that after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, the sea, or any tree. So these angels are holding back the winds of strife, which is, 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 is destruction and immorality and crime and evil. The angels are holding these things back, but they're not going to hold them back much longer. Why? Because notice what great controversy says. But the Christian world has shown contempt for the law of Jehovah. And the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law. So in other words, as we become more secular and more evil in our society, God withdraws more and more and then evil and problems have more of their reign. Now let me just share this with you, okay? Testimonies volume 6 is this. The restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. Hurricanes, storms, now this is written 160 years ago. Tempests, fire and flood, disasters by sea and land. Follow each other in quick, what's that next word everybody? Succession, one after another. Now I didn't do this, but I imagine if you look at 2016, 2015, and 2017, it's going to be the same thing. All over the world, there's just disaster after disaster happening. As a matter of fact, uh, this couple or two weeks ago, uh, we babysat, uh, not really babysat when they're teenagers, I don't know what you call it, but we had a kid over and watched him all day, one of our old church members' uh, uh, kids. And uh, so we took uh, Eden and him over to the Science Museum, and they had an IMAX movie there about the natural disasters are taking place. And you could, it was the first time ever I actually had 3D glasses on. Anybody had never watched one of those things with 3D? It was kind of neat because you like had a tornado like coming at you. You felt like it was going to hit you, you know, and stuff like that. So it was kind of neat to do that. But in there, it had just all the catastrophes, many of the catastrophes that are happening all around the world. And of course, science seeks to explain all these. Now, whether they're right or not, I'm not here to argue that. Of course, they say it's global warming. That's kind of what the movie was meant for. But it's true. There's science is seeking to explain all these things, but really the bottom line issue is we are getting further and further away from the Word of God in our society, and that is the reason why all these things are happening. All right? Now, the Pope has a suggestion for us. He wrote this thing in 2016 or 2015. I can't remember when it came out now, but it was called an encyclica on climate change. And he went around the world promoting this. And one of his points, as you know very well, was that uh, Sunday and getting back to Sunday and getting back to family and getting back to you know resting the land is the one of the keys to the answer to climate change. Now he's pushing this and people don't understand where it's going, but you and I with this prophetic eye, we can see that this is could definitely bring Democrats and Republicans together because Democrats are so hardcore in climate change, Republicans see the immorality problem and this could definitely. And so I'm going to say this too. You know, people have thought, oh, if the Democrats are in power, it's going to save us from the Sunday law. My friends, it does not matter who is in power during this time. If the Republicans or Democrats, this world is going to fall apart. There's going to be so many disasters, so many things that... Uh, the whole world is going to be swept away with this thing, except for those who truly knew, know the Word of God, all right? Now, I always like to share this picture right here, this statement. I've been visiting the ocean for, uh, you know, uh, several times in the last 15 years, and it says this, in the last scenes of Earth's history, the waters of the deep will overflow their what, everybody? Their boundaries, property, and life will be destroyed by flood. Now, here's a picture of my daughter and I in Monterey Bay out in the Pacific Ocean. And I'll tell you, every time I go to the ocean and to the beach, as I'm walking, this quotation is in the back of my mind. And as that wave comes closer, I think to myself, are you going to respect your boundaries or not? Because I know what's going to happen, right? And uh, this is going to happen more and more and more, and this is going to lead up. Now, here's my last uh, quotation on this, and we'll move on. Satan puts his interpretation upon these events, this immorality, this destruction, and they think, as he would have them, that the calamities which fill the land are a result of Sunday breaking. That's what the Pope is saying. That's one of his points right now. Uh, in his encyclical, thinking to appease the wrath of God, these influential men make laws enforcing uh, Sunday observance. This was written like 160 years ago, all right? All right, so let's move off that now. And two more short points. Afflicting the soul. As I shared with you, if you study Bible prophecy very carefully and study the Old Testament very carefully, since 1844, we have been living under the antitypical Day of Atonement, the judgment. The judgment, as described in Daniel chapter 7, is taking place in heaven right now. It began with Adam, then Eve was the next one. Every single person gets their time, their day in court. All that we have said, all that we have done, is all examined in this court to see if we truly belong to Christ or not, okay? And uh, truly have taken, put on his robe of righteousness, truly have ex uh, um, appreciated 
appreciated and accepted his sacrifice, and he is the Lord of our lives. Okay, so people just think, well, just because I said this little prayer in 1980, I get a free pass. No, your works, the Bible tells us very clearly, are examined to see, do you really appreciate and have accepted the sacrifice of Christ? Is he the Lord and Savior of your life? Okay, so every single person in here has their day in court. Now, we're not there physically, but our case has a, uh, our case gets heard. Now, you might think, what about that text that says we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ? That Greek word there means our character is appear. Our case appears there. Um, so right now, I don't know. I mean, I, they probably take a, a break on Sabbath, but you know, my name might be being reviewed right now. Your v name might be being, re being reviewed right now. We don't know when our case will be up there in heaven. Okay. Now, in the antitypical day of atonement, which was a judgment day, notice what the Bible says here. Also, the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your what, everybody? your souls. Now here's the question. So on the Day of Atonement, by the way, Mrs. White says that the, the Day of Atonement in ancient Israel was so solemn that even the angels trembled. Now just think about that. They trembled for God's people because it was God's searching of the heart. Even the angels trembled on the Day of Atonement. And so we live in this antitypical Day of Atonement. We should take it very seriously too. Now what does it mean to afflict your soul? Now uh, Boyd could give you a great definition of it because I asked him beforehand and uh, uh, he, he's got a spot on. But I'll tell you, when I first started studying Bible, in the Day of Atonement, I thought that afflicting your soul meant fasting, right? And so kind of the idea like Martin Luther, here's a picture of me at the monastery where Luther was at. Luther was there and he would whip his back and he would sleep on a, on a, on a on basically a board. He would go around begging for food and fast all the time. And then they had a little room there at this monastery. It was kind of neat to be there because it hasn't changed that much. And so at this monastery, they would meet in this room a few times every single day and these monks would sit down and they would just pick each other apart. I saw you eat too much. I saw that you're not reading your Bible enough. And so they would just constantly pick on each other. Is that, what it, is that what it means to afflict your soul? No, because that's a very superficial thing, right? What afflicting your soul means, and I'll come to, I, mean, I got my little point. Here's what it means. Here's what the SD Bible commentary says. Very good definition. Afflicting your soul. This was more than fasting. It included soul what, everybody? Searching. Really looking deep down at your life and at your heart to see, am I right with God? You would look at your motives. You would look at your behavior. Why am I doing this? How am I using my time? How am I using my talents? All these different type of things would come to one's mind during the Day of Atonement. A review of one's progress in holy living. In other words, how much have I grown? Am I a growing Christian? Or am I no, really no more advanced right now than I was 10 years ago? See, we should be able to look at our, look back at ourselves, not maybe, a, maybe six months or something like that, because growth happens very slowly in, in all of our lives, but we should be able to look back over 10 year periods, my friends, and see that we have made progress in our Christian walk. But the vast majority of people have not. And so all this stuff came into play during the Day of Atonement. A seeking of God, confession of sin, making amends for neglected duties, squaring accounts with God and with men. You know, I, I sat through um, a little talk years ago out in California, a guy talking about the Day of Atonement, a Seventh-day Adventist man, and he said that um, he had a neighbor who was Jewish, and the Jews to this day take the Day of Atonement very seriously. Now, Sandy Koufax, the great Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher, he, one year it came that the uh, World Series, Game 1, took place on... Uh, uh, on the Day of Atonement, and he refused to pitch that day. Now, as far as I know, he would pitch any other Sabbath, but he would not pitch on that day. So anyways, this guy was telling us that his neighbor was Jewish, and leading up to the Day of Atonement, his neighbor came over and he asked for forgiveness for something he had done, and he kind of scratched his head. He goes, I don't really remember that, but that's how serious Jews take this, that there's nothing in their life, there's nothing in their heart that comes between them and their God, thus redeeming the time, all right? So, uh, Here's a summary of what afflicting our soul means, because that's what we need to be doing. Okay? Not that we walk around that and we're not happy ever, but we need to take a deep look, a deep checklist at our life and our relationship with God. Getting, giving serious care for your relationship with God and whether or not your heart is 100% right with Him. That is what afflicting the soul means. Not afflicting your soul means you don't really care about pleasing God. And that's the bottom line, really, in the judgment, is what it's going to come down to is who cares and who really doesn't care. Because the provision has been made. 
but do you really care about pleasing the God, pleasing God in your life or not? Because Jesus Christ has made the way, right? Uh, but, but do you want to live in an environment where there is no sin, okay? Woe, here's what the Amos 6 verse 1 says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Woe to those who are just comfortable with their relationship with God. There's no soul searching. They're just comfortable, right? Now, let me, I'm going to go on here. I'm getting close to being done, but I want you to notice what Amos chapter 7 says. God said, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Now, you know what a plumb line is, right? Plumb line, you still use them to this day. It's a long string, and has, at the end of it, it's got a, like an arrowhead. And you, you put that on a wall in order to see if that wall is perfectly perpendicular or not, right? And God says, i got a plumb line. And I'm going to take this plumb line, which is the Word of God, to your life and measure it. Okay? And so, you know, God is very merciful. He's very patient. If we don't understand, if we don't know, but if we know what's right and we don't do it, that plumb line is going to flush that out and there's no excuse in the day of judgment. There's absolutely none. All right? Okay, let's go on. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says this, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. So I like how the SDA commentary commented on this. Every follower of Christ can profitably examine his own life each day. You know, every night before we go to bed, we should get on our knees and kind of review our day and say, Lord, you know, and, and, and confess our sins. Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said this or I shouldn't have done that. I, I had no business, you know, saying this to that person. And we really need to take a low, close look at our life. And God will forgive us when we ask for forgiveness and we ask for help to overcome these things. Now, I like this part right here. I had to leave this in here. If we would be more critical of ourselves, we would be less critical of who, everybody? Others. Because you would realize if you take a good look at yourself, like the Day of Atonement calls us to do, that you've got plenty to work on yourself and you don't need to be worried about other people, right? And uh, that's what it teaches us. Okay, so here. Examine your life and motives. Am I using my time wisely? Am I using my resources as God would have me? Do I just spend money? Do I just waste my time watching all this entertainment and doing all these things while my Bible is just simply gathering dust? And it goes on. Uh, I go on here. Why am I honestly behaving this way? Why am I talking this way or even wearing this? Okay, all these mode, or these, 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 uh, these thoughts should go, we should allow the Holy Spirit to convict us and flush out these things in our life so that we can confess or forsake them. Great Controversy, page 49, says, We are now living in the great day of atonement. In a typical service, while the high priest was making the atonement for Israel, all were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. In the like manner, all who would have their names retained in the book of life should now, in the few remaining days of their probation, afflict their souls before God by deep sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be a deep, faithful searching of heart. Can you say amen to that, everybody? Okay, well, that was a weak amen, but I'll let you pass because you're probably feeling the day of atonement, right? And it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good. We need to be humble before the Lord. Okay, so anybody who did not afflict their soul, the Bible says they were cut off from the people of God. Okay, so let me close now with some great New Year's practices to help you. Uh, gain victory, grow in your relationship with God. Some great New Year's practices. I've got just a few of them here and then I'm going to pray. Number one is have a strong devotional life. You know, we've, uh, Tangela and the personal ministries team have just given this uh, cookie cutter type way where we can just grab the sheet and have a strong devotional life with God. Reading the Bible through in one year, reading these other spiritual books. You know, we have all these, so many devotional tools that we can use. Um, that we need to take advantage of them, okay? Number two is, or going, kind of going along with this, Jesus talked about end-time events. He said, watch and pray. Now, if you're like me, you have a difficult time praying, and your mind wanders off, and, and pretty soon after a few minutes have passed, you're like, what's the point anyways? So I've done, been begin to do something a few months ago that's really, really helped me, and that is develop a prayer, get a prayer notebook that I keep right by my bed. And things that are going on in my life are going on special things. I don't have in there like pray for the United States of America. I don't have that in there, but there are very specific things and I have a Bible promise. And I go through that booklet every morning and every night. For example, uh, most of you know Alan Wong has got this bad uh, leg, that, a bad ankle that he's been struggling with. Well, you know, I feel bad for him. He's in my prayer notebook and I've been praying for him every morning and every night. Now, as soon as Alan gets better, he's getting taken out of there, right? But, um, and I'm hoping that that's very soon. And uh, if Alan's watching, we miss you very much. But, uh, you know, we, I have this list. And when I, I've noticed that when I make a list, I can pray for a long time and really connect with the Lord for, for 30 minutes and not even realize the time has gone by. So if you have a difficulty praying, you know, get a notebook, all right? Alan White says, I, I, I quoted earlier, 
He said, only those who have fortified their minds with the word of God will be able to stand these last great deceptions of Satan. Okay? Number two is, have family worship at least once per day. I'm so surprised with how many Adventists are not having family worship anymore. Now, I get it that people got to get up and rush off, you know, uh, for work and diff different schedule, but every Adventist home should have family worship where you sit down, open the word of God, sing some songs, pray, and read something out of the Bible, especially for kids. You know, kids have some hard time sitting in church, and I, oftentimes it's because their family are not having family worship at home. Have family worship every single day. You know, I couldn't find this quotation, but... Um, and so I'm not sure if it, if it exists. How do you like that? Um, but somebody, I, somebody told me one time, I don't remember who it was, and I think it was a credible source, they said that Mrs. White actually said that she did not feel comfortable staying in somebody's home that did not have family worship in it. Because when you do that and the television is on all the time, you've got demonic activity in your home. But singing praises to God, reading His Word, drives those things away. And there's peace and contentment. So have family worship. Even if it's just husband and wife, you should have family worship. Get a devotional book where you read through it every single day and pray and sing together, and you'll see a big difference in your home, right? Uh, I'm going to fast forward here. Number three is, now, make prayer meeting and Sabbath school high priorities. Now, I get it. I get this church. The biggest challenge with this church is distance. So many of you live so far away. Um, you know, some people have kids. Uh, some people have to work during that time. You know, they have little kids, so they can't make it to prayer meeting. I totally get it. But if you can, my friends, you should make that a high priority in your list to come to prayer meeting. You know, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, sir. You know, when I lead out in prayer meeting, when Boyd leads out, it's always good, okay? So I'm speaking about myself. When I lead out in prayer meeting, I realize that not every week is good. Some weeks are kind of boring, probably, actually. I try my best or whatever. Now, when Boyd leads out, every week is top-notch, right? But I realize that not every week you come to prayer meeting is going to be like electric thrills coming up out of your spine. You're going to be praising. I realize it's not like that. But discipline over time, my friends, is beneficial. And you know, Sabbath school, we can all be here on time for Sabbath school. There's really no reason for that. Why a person can't be here once a week for Sabbath school? Make these, my friends, high priorities in your life. Notice what the Bible says here, talking about the end of time. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Okay, is that you? Is that you? Are you the manner of some? But exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So we're not to meet less and less as the coming of Christ becomes nearer. We are to gather more and more together. But you know what's very interesting? Is that you talk to pastors all over the United States and they'll say that the two things that they have the biggest difficulty is, is prayer meeting and most, a lot of churches have just done away with prayer meeting because the attendance has gone so small. Prayer meeting and Sabbath school, okay? But 50 years ago, prayer meeting and Sabbath school were strong. But the Bible tells us that no, as Christ's coming becomes closer, we are to meet and gather more and more together. And so if you can, my friends, make Sabbath school and prayer meeting a priority in your life, I promise you, you will not be sorry. You're not going to lay in your deathbed many years from now. You're not going to lay there and think, man, I wish I wouldn't have gone to prayer meeting. I wish I wouldn't go to Sabbath school. You'll have the exact opposite kind of feelings. I wish I would have spent more time with God. I wish I would have spent more time with his people, all right? Okay, let me fast forward here. And last, uh, last one. Use your spiritual gifts for the building up of God's church. Every single person in here has got gifts and talents that are different. All right? And God has created you to build up His church, His movement with those gifts. But most people, 80% of most churches, 80% of the members are not using their spiritual gifts. Right? Now, I read this quotation from the Bible to a kid uh, well, I call him a kid, but uh, he's kind of contemplating joining the church or not. And this is not in this area. It was up in Indianapolis. And I shared with him one of the great benefits of joining the church is you use your spiritual gifts. This is so important for all of us to be using our spiritual gifts because it helps us grow closer to Christ. Now, notice what the Bible says. Those who do not use their talents says this. I'll fast forward here because I'm out of time. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer dark darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those are the words of Jesus right there. He was a Christian, but he was not using his spiritual gifts. He was hiding them. He was so caught up in everything else, he wasn't using his spiritual gifts to the Lord. And the Bible tells that he's going to be lost. All right? Okay. Last little story that I want to share with you is about Charles Finney. And Charles Finney was, you can see the dates there, kind of 1792 to 1875. 
And uh, I always wonder if he, how he related to the Millerite movement because he was a very solid Christian man. He was a revivalist. And uh, his doctrine, he was against slavery, you know, which was rare for his time. And that was what the Millerites, they were against slavery. He also believed in overcoming sin, and which, you know, a lot of people just feel like, you know, Jesus gives us his credit card to go and sin. But he believed in overcoming sin through Christ. So he had a lot of really strong doctrines. As a matter of fact, Ellen White quotes him one time, and it's in a very favorable light. So Charles Finney was a great revivalist. A lot of people were converted through his preaching. He preached a very strong and straight message. Well, Finney's conversion story is very unique, and that's what I wanted to share with you, and I want you to think about this in your own life. Finney went off to school, college, university, or whatever, and he was a lawyer. And as he graduated from school, and, or was graduating from school, one of his friends who was a Christian approached him, and he said, uh, Charles, what are you going to do with your life? And he said, well, I'm going to graduate law school. I'm going to go get a, uh, graduate law school. And he said, okay, well, what are you going to do after that? And Finney said, well, my plan is to get a law firm in some big city, make a whole bunch of money, and get a big house, and get family and friends. That's my plan. That's what I want to do. And he said, oh, that's okay. And after that? And he said, well, I'll probably retire. A big fat cat and live off the interest of uh, my investments, and I'll have a very nice retirement, travel the world with my family. And then he said, but what about after that? And he said, well, what are you trying to get at? I'm going to die, right? I'm going to die. Is that what you're trying to get at? And he said, but what about after that? And that's the key. And Finney, when he really thought about that for a moment and realized that this world is not it and there's a judgment to come after this, he actually went into a grove of trees just like William Miller did and he wrestled with the Lord. And he came out of there not wanting to practice law anymore, but he did dedicated his life to the ministry of God. And that's my question to you. What are you chasing? What are you doing? Because, you know, I'm 40. I turned 40 this year. It's gone by just like that. You think to yourself, I was born this way. These gray hairs, I came out of my mom's womb with these gray hairs. No, I had a, I had a childhood. I had a teenage years. I had a, a high school. And it's gone by so fast. And I'll tell you that when I'm dying in my bed, if the Lord does not come, I am not going to be one bit sorry of the path that I chose for myself because I believe by the grace of God when the judgment takes place, through Christ Jesus, my name will pass that. And that's what I want for all of you. So in 2017, my friends, take it very serious. Take it serious like you never have before, your relationship with God and your walk with Him. So that when your name is called up yonder, you will be there. And when your names, when those who are called down yonder, your name won't be amongst that group. Can you say amen to that, everybody?